Okay. Thank you, Dr. Buskey, for that. No? Okay. Okay. Uh, when you're when you're here, we can hear you, but it's so low like like how about now? Did I press something? Maybe an accident. Is this the volume? Can you hear me? Testing, testing. Sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> I might have to use the hand mic. Okay, I can maybe do that. Hello? Test, 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 test. Test, 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 test. Again. Okay, that's good. Test. good as it gets. This is loud as it gets. Yeah. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Kind of. All right, we'll see how it goes. And if we need to, we'll just switch on over to the other. Um, I'm usually a little soft-spoken, so um, unfortunately. Okay, <clears throat> 2022. It was um, a year um, filled with lots of challenges at the ARC, um, but it was also a year of, of celebration and reflection and ultimately a year that... Um, will bring a new hope for the ARC and for the future of the ARC. So, um, let's see, maybe we'll just stick to this. <laughs> this trips me up too, you have to click on it. But this one, uh, no, this one, no, that one. Is no, no, no. Okay, we'll just continue on until Adriana has me <laughs> operating. <laughs> All right, so the ARC, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, is the Amos Rehabilitation Keep. We um, rescue and rehabilitate. Uh, it looks like something's moving. I, I turned it on. Okay, maybe that's all I needed. <laughs> all right, perfect. Go. All right. So the ARC is a rehab facility for, we rescue and rehabilitate sea turtles, marine birds, and raptors. Um, and so we have about 1,500 patients per year. Um, the ARC was started by Tony Amos, who was a local warrior for the environment and um, one of my heroes. Um, so rescue and rehabilitation is sort of the the main part of the job. Um, and so we're gonna get into some of that. Um, sea turtle strandings, we had 835 turtles that stranded this year and um, about 450 of those were live. And so ended up in our care at the ARC. So per month, you can see we've got some um, big spikes um, in February and then also in December. But throughout the summer months, we end into September, it was pretty steady as well. So um, we'll kind of come back to those um, spikes and maybe talk about maybe why some of that happened. So uh, sea turtle strandings by species, this is uh, really important this year because <clears throat> Um, because as you can see, we've got, I'm trying to figure out how this all works because I think I'm distracting you. Um, maybe. Um, so the green sea turtles, um, is our normal species that we, um, deal with the most. That's our most common, um, admit to the arc. Mm -hmm. But this year we had a high number of loggerhead sea turtles. So we had about 62% greens and then a high number of loggerheads, about 34%. If you look at our five-year average, that number is much less for loggerheads, only 12% um, normally. So something is up. Um, so let's talk about those two kind of anomalies. Um, so in that first slide where we were looking at the months, um, we saw those big spikes in winter. Um, and so we had 
Colston Turtles um, in February and December. Those were the big um, events. And for those of you who maybe don't know about cold sun, uh, cold sunning events. So this happens whenever these green sea turtles, they go into shallow areas in our bays and our estuaries. They eat algae and seagrass. So that's what draws them in. They're coming for that seagrass and we have beautiful seagrass meadows for them and uh, they get there and they don't want to leave. Um, and so it gets cold. We have these sudden drops like we did this past December right around Christmas, um, you know, much to our dismay. And um, and so the water gets colder. These guys get stuck in those bays. They become lethargic. They're ectothermic, so um, all reptiles are. So their body temperature is really dependent on their environment. So they become lethargic. They float to the surface. They can um, they can become um, a victim of a boat strike because they're not able to evade that um, or predation. They can't evade predators. Um, onshore winds will push them onto the backsides of islands and um, they can, um, you know, die from exposure or drowning. Um, so there's a lot of ways that um, really can lead to um to the unfortunate end for them. And so it's really important for us to get out there and, and help to rescue these turtles. Um, it can be very difficult during these cold sunning events on our staff and our volunteers and our resources as well. Um, but the good news is they don't usually last very long. They can last about five days, unless you're winter storm Uri, which lasted about two weeks. We're gonna, <laughs> Definitely talk a little bit more about that, but not too much detail because we're talking about 2022, which, you know, is different. Um, we've moved on. And so um, loggerheads are, are a different kind of stranding for sure. Um, and so um, we needed to kind of explore what that meant. How was it different and um, and how did we deal with that problem? Okay, so the five-year average for loggerheads that we get into the arc, um, we get, yes, perfect, that's so distracting. Um, we, we normally get about 40 turtles, loggerheads a year, 40. Now, 40 turtles is very different from the almost 300 that we got this year. So, um, we we were pretty concerned by what was happening. And so um, over the course of the year, we saw it start in April, which is sort of normal. That's when loggerhead strandings start normally. So we saw this heightened number, but we were like, okay, this is kind of weird, but it's not gonna last. This is just a, um, a the start of a, a small straining pulse. And then in May, it boomed, which normally it kind of booms in May, but not like this. And then it continued all the way through September. And even that first week of October, we were still finding uh, loggerheads. So um, pretty, you know, stressful. And we were, we were pretty worried about these turtles. So we kind of changed gears and we started really, how do we deal with this? We need to up our stranding and rescue efforts, increase those. We need to start working with our volunteers more to help us with these rescues because we just can't be everywhere. And so our volunteers, they they stepped up and they helped us to rescue um, a lot of these turtles, um, most of them. And um, what we discovered during that process is that this stranding was different than what we had seen in the past. When we had loggerhead stranding in the past, they were they were really emaciated. They were very thin, um, so much so that their plastron, the bottom part of their shell, would be concave, um, and um, their bones on their skull would um, would be coming through the skin. That's how emaciated. Um, they'd be totally encrusted by epibiota. When I say epibiota, I mean acorn barnacles, uh, algae, um, 
different types of worms. They get all kinds of things on the back of their shell. And when they become debilitated, they get even more. So that was what we normally saw. Um, and this year we saw turtles that were thin, but they weren't to that level. Um, and yes, they had epibiota, a lot of it, but not completely encrusted. So it was presenting very differently. Um, and um, so we began getting these turtles in. What we noticed was that a lot of them were drowning. Um, so we had to treat that. Um, and we also had to stabilize them. Um, and so that meant lots of blood work. We were taking blood samples from these turtles um, at admission for sampling um, to figure this thing out, but also to help know what kind of treatment we needed to give them. And most of them were um, very um, hypoglycemic. So their blood sugar was even too low to read on a glucometer. So um, normally our turtles will come in and even at the worst case, it might be like 20. Um, normal is 60. These would say error, too low to read. So something was definitely wrong. Um, so we'd have to start giving them fluids with dextrose, which is the sugar, to help bump up their their blood sugar. Um, and they were dehydrated, so that fluid really helped too. Um, but at the same time, we couldn't give them too much fluids because they were near drowning, so you can't overwhelm their body with additional fluids. Um, and so they were um, their protein levels were really low, and that can. Um, if you give too much fluids can also be detrimental. So it was a very delicate balance on getting these guys stabilized, plus antibiotics and, and just tons and tons of work. We would put them in tanks because um, these are large turtles. They're anywhere from 50 to 200 pounds. And most of them were on the 100 pound range-ish. And so you've got this large animal that is um, that lives in the water and the water helps keep them buoyant. If you put them on land, now all that weight is on their body and that is not good. They just don't do well that way. So we're trying to get them in water, but they're weak. Um, and so that means they're at risk of drowning. Um, so it was constant putting them on, on pads, putting them in water, lowering the water, deepening the water. What can they take? Monitoring constantly. Um, in this process, we also discovered that um, a lot of people that were, you know, good meaning people, they were putting the turtles when they found them back into the water. And so these guys needed our help. But here they go, we push them back and then they're fighting the waves again. And so more of them were drowning. So we had to increase our public education. Now the locals here, they knew to give us a call, but this is in the middle of summer when you have all these visitors here that may not know about the ARC and know who to call. So it was really important for our volunteers who were out there helping to rescue to also educate everyone about this event. Plus, we were in the media a lot to get the word out there. Um, but as this progressed, we realized that we did not have the space to take all care of all of these turtles and the resources, all of the staff that was needed and the volunteers. And so um, we needed to find a way to work with some of our partners. And so we started working with the Texas State Aquarium and the Texas Sea Life Center, and we started transferring turtles to them once they were stable. Now, there's the key word, once they are stable. Um, that ranged anywhere from one to 84 days um, before we could stabilize them and transfer them. So, um, and then once they were able to be transported to another facility, um, they were, at that point, they were mostly either off of antibiotics or only a few more days of antibiotics. And so they're really just giving them uh, food and time. And they needed that time to start repairing because um, turtles are amazing animals. And given time and a safe space, 
good care and a veterinarian, they really can repair and, and heal and do well. But they needed the food and the time to rebuild those red blood cells, get everything in check. And so the Texas State Aquarium and the Sea Life Center, they were able to step in for us. And overall, we transferred 55 turtles to them. So huge help. Um, so now kind of shifting gears in the mix of all this, we're trying to figure out what is causing this. We have no idea, you know? So at first these turtles are coming in in April and we thought, well, maybe it's fisheries, maybe it's shrimping, you know, this has caused some issues for turtles in the past. Um, you know, maybe they're getting caught in these nets and they're drowning or they sometimes they get the bends from, um, from being in deep water, they get caught in net and they come up too fast. That's something that we've seen in the past with loggerheads. So we thought maybe it's shrimping industry um, and we just need to do some education with them. Well, the shrimping uh, season opened, the shrimping season closed and we still saw lots of turtles coming in. So that kind of took a back seat as to maybe the cause um, in our minds. So meanwhile, we, what else can you do? Well, these turtles are dying. We need to um, to use that and um, and use that for science. So we started salvaging the carcasses for necropsy. We would we had ninety seven turtles that we salvaged for necropsy. Um, in each necropsy, we did thirty five to forty different samples for each turtle. These necropsies would take hours. Um, but it was important. It was important to figure this out. And so we send in these samples um, to different researchers to try to figure this out. And there's still a lot of testing left to do, but preliminarily, um, we started thinking maybe it's a biotoxin, like a harmful algal bloom. So, you know, red tide can cause some pretty big issues for turtles and other um, harmful algal blooms. We thought maybe it's a biotoxin. They came into contact with it before they came into our area. Um, and as they were migrating over, they got into something. Could it be a toxin? Well, we tested for that. Nope. Heavy metals. Um, those can be persistent. Maybe it's that. Nope, not that. Um, okay, go back to the drawing board. Well, we just went through a pandemic. Maybe it's an infectious disease. That's on everybody's mind, right? Got to be a virus. Um, and guess what? Not that. Um, okay, so if it's none of those things, well, they are weak. They on necropsy, we we discovered that the only thing they all really had in common that was pretty consistent was that they were actually more emaciated than um, they outwardly appeared. They had edema, so they had a lot of fluid buildup, but they were still really thin once you um, once you open them up for necropsy. And so we thought, well, maybe there's a food shortage. Last year, there was a huge drought. Maybe some of you remember that. Um, and so if there's a drought, that can affect blue crab populations. Blue crabs flourish when there's fresh water. Um, and loggerheads, they predominantly feed on blue crabs. Um, so we thought, okay, could be a food shortage. Well, I went to the literature and those loggerheads, I love turtles. Um, so they do not want to go down without a fight. And with these turtles, um, they've seen in other parts of the country, whenever there was a... Um, a sudden drop in one food source, they just switch over to fish. Oh, can't find crabs? Let's eat some menhaden. And so, they, you know, they're not going to go down without a fight. And um, yeah, that's probably, you can't really say this was for sure a food sh shortage if they're so adaptable. So um, more information is needed still. Um, and, and that's something we're going to keep working on. But at this point, we still don't know what is going on with these turtles. So what else can we do? Because there's got to be something else. And we talked to Florida. Um, they've seen this before in their loggerheads. They had a, a big year in 2006 where they had hundreds of loggerheads coming in. And they did all the testing and they came up empty handed too. Everyone has told me, just start wrapping your brain around the fact that you'll probably never know. That's not very easy to digest, um, you know? And so uh, what else can we do? Well, we contacted NOAA to see if they could maybe get some funding together to get some transmitters for these turtles. And they did. 
So they were able to purchase six satellite transmitters. So every time a turtle surfaces, it pings the satellite and boom, we know where that turtle is. Well, meat crop season sampling isn't proving anything. Let's see where they're going. That, let's go back to the basics. And so we got these six satellite transmitters. Two of them were put on turtles from the ARC. Two were from the, um, the Texas Sea Life Center and two from the aquarium. But all of them came from our beaches. This is the epicenter of the strandings. Um, and so um, we, we worked with Padre Island National Seashore with Dr. Donna Shaver. She has the permits to put these transmitters on. We're so thankful for that. Um, so the first turtle that we got a transmitter for was Fred. He was rescued in June um, and released in September. Um, and we were able to track Fred for 58 days. Um, Fred hung out in Port A for a while. And then he went on down to Packery, hung out over there. And then he was like, let's check out Ball Hall Pier. Let's do that. And then went south. And then came all the way back up. And then after 58 days, we we lost transmission. Now, why does, oh, another thing to mention, I can't believe I forgot. You've got a couple of wonky points. I don't know if you can see that, but um, some over on, you know, over land, turtles can't fly. So um, <laughs> these transmitters are not perfect. <laughs> so um, let's just emit those in our brains, pretend they don't exist. Um, so, um, yeah, just, you know, disregard. But anyway, so it stopped transmitting 58 days after we applied it and released the turtle. That can happen for a variety of reasons. Um, sometimes we, we use epoxies to put these on. Well, we live in a marine environment and it's difficult. Sometimes these turtles, they like to rub their backs on the bottoms of um, oil rigs and uh, debris and rocks and um, and maybe it just rubbed it right off. And so um, it could have just fallen off um, or something happened to the turtle. I like to choose the first one in my brain. Um, we haven't found a carcass and this is in the area that we patrol heavily. So um, each of these turtles gets pit tagged as well. So we would have, we would have found it. Um, so, we don't know exactly where Fred would have gone long term, but um, still we got some data. He was hanging around. Actually, he was a she, but that's different. Um, so Crush, though, is a he. Um, it was an adult male loggerhead. And so these turtles, males, are really rare. We put a lot of transmitters on turtles as scientists, but they're almost all exclusively females because we've got an opportunity. They come up onto the beach to nest. That's very easy to get a transmitter on a nesting turtle. But these males, once they hatch, they go into the water and they are never seen again unless they come into trouble and end up at the ark. But, um, but normally you never see a male again. So um, we don't have, we don't know all that much about male uh, migrations. And so this was a really good opportunity. Everybody wanted to get a transmitter on this turtle and, and he was strong. So he was a good um, candidate for transmission. And so we re rescued him on Ju in July, we released him in October. And right now he's still tracking, but he's hanging out in the area. Um, like I said, omit some of those points. Um, he did not go into Baffin Bay um, or Corpus Christi Bay. Um, so, um, yeah, he left port where we released him right here on the beach near uh, the jetty. Um, and then he went south. No, he went north first. He went north up to uh, San Jose. Then he went back south, down to south, to North Padre, and then back up. But he's still tracking. I haven't got an update from, um, from Penn since December. So hopefully soon we'll know more about what Crush is doing now that it's a little bit colder. So we're still gathering data on this anomaly with the loggerheads, but we still, we don't really know why it happened. Um, but it isn't, continuing, which is a good, good thing. Um, bird rehab. So um, sea turtles are not the only animals that we care for. We also care for marine birds and raptors. Um, and so we had 731 admissions of birds. Um, and 
101 different species, which is kind of cool. Um, so bird emissions for the month, the spring is the busy time, but also the summer. Um, and so um, May, definitely our biggest month for, for bird rehab admissions. So going back to species diversity, I, I think one of the coolest things about uh, being at a rehab facility with birds is that you get to see so many different species but it also has its big challenges because caring for say a green heron like that one in the, or actually that is a least bittern, sorry. Uh, a least bittern like in the photo um, compared to say a red tailed hawk or a barn owl is very, very different. Um, so, you know, learning all of the natural histories of all of the bird species that come through our doors is, is challenging, but it's also kind of fun. So um, this year we had uh, 101 species, which made up of 37 different families of birds. And the most diverse were Ardidae, um, which is our bitterns, our herons, and our egrets, and a laridae, which is skimmers, terns, and gulls. Um, kind of makes sense for where we live, right? Um, but our most common bird patient at the ARC is our brown pelican, also makes sense for where we live. Um, we had 159 admissions of brown pelicans, um, and we have a bird banding project at the ARC. So we banded six of these birds, 60 of these birds, 60, that's a lot, um, and released them. We released a few more, but um, they were probably already banded. They were repeat customers, um, but 60 that were new banded birds. Um, and so um, this project is really exciting because we have learned so much and it started, um, end of 2018 or so, um, but we had a, a big pulse of, of um, brown pelicans coming in. So we wanted to learn more about that too. And um, this project has given us so much knowledge because we learned that these birds, if they go to an area where there's a lot of fishermen and they come in because they were entangled or they ingested a hook or maybe a hardhead catfish, which is not on the menu normally, but fishermen will sometimes feed them to these brown pelicans and they get stuck in their throat or their pouch. And um, so those guys who end up in our care, guess what happens to them? They end up in our care over and over and over again, or they'll hang out in the fishing spots and they ultimately won't end up in our care and, um, you know, until the point where we can't help them. And so, um, but the ones that come in for maybe a high parasite load or something like that, that aren't really humanized, those guys, they take off and we don't ever see them again. They do their own things. Um, so it's really important not to, uh, to give these guys hands, handouts. Um, and, um, and so, if you want to participate in this project, it is a citizen science science project. So you can report bands that you see um, in that photo. You can see on its uh, leg the YT8. Um, so we have two bands on them. One's metal, and one's this big auxiliary marker that you maybe can see with your naked eye um, or binox um, if you're like me. But um, and then you can report it to reportband.gov which is pretty cool. One of our birds was uh, spotted a couple of weeks after release in uh, Tamaulipas, Mexico, kind of cool. So you could be part of a really neat project. Um, so bird rehab this year was not without its challenges. Um, this year we had a big threat, we still have it, of um, avian influenza or bird flu. Maybe some of you have heard of this. Um, and so, we, we started watching this. It was really um, predominantly up north. And we're like, oh, well, it's their problem. Um, but it, it was starting to spread. And it was like knocking on our doors. And, you know, we needed to really learn more about the bird flu, how it could affect our birds. What was the risk to our volunteers and our staff? Was there a human risk? Well, the answer is um, pretty low risk to people, thankfully, with this um, strand of the virus. Um, it was less um, transmissible to humans. Yay! 
we win. Um, but it was highly pathogenic to birds. So very, very contagious to birds. Um, and there were definitely um, carriers with no symptoms. Um, and so that was scary. Um, and then we needed to learn more about how to rescue and intake and do this job, um, how to make everything safer, um, biosecurity risks to um, to all of our birds that we we're caring for. And honestly, we were, I'm sitting through all these trainings trying to learn, and I just kept thinking to myself, um, how do we accomplish what is required to help and keep everyone safe with what we have available? This was going to cost a lot. And it needed a lot of people and a lot of space too. We needed to have quarantine areas. This is going to be, you know, it was just daunting and it felt impossible. But ultimately, I also kept going back to these guys. This is Cricket and uh, Claudia and Bobo. Um, they're some of our resident raptors. Cricket's our eastern screech owl and Claudia and Bobo are barred owls. Um, and I just kept thinking about this virus and it, it's lethal, mostly lethal. There have been a few few cases that they've been able to treat, but it's lethal and it, it's gruesome. And I just couldn't imagine our poor birds going through this. So we knew we had to do something. So we increased all of our biosecurity protocols. Um, we needed more rigorous disinfection. We developed cohorts, people that could work with quarantine birds, ones that could work with... Um, with birds that were were clean, that they've already passed quarantine and our resident raptor, our resident birds. Um, we needed um, to change our intake protocols and, and create those quarantine areas. That took a little bit of uh, creativity, but we're the ARC, we make it work. <laughs> and uh, so, and then we also needed to increase our testing um, and, and become conservative about what animals we could take and what we could really care for. And, um, and, and that sampling was going to be expensive. We knew it, but we had to do it. Um, we also increased all of our training for our volunteers and our staff so that when our volunteers were going out to rescue these birds, they, they knew how to identify the symptoms. Um, they knew what the risks were and they, they knew all of the new procedures. So that way they could um, bring these animals back and put them in the appropriate locations. They knew that, okay, I just rescued this bird that could be potentially sick. I can't go handle cricket now, you know, like you got to make sure that everyone is aware of what all those protocols are. So to date, um, this is a map that's on, I think the USDA's website and it's everywhere. It's in every state and it's here. Um, it's in our area. I think for our numbers, it's um, probably heavily unreported. These numbers are way lower than what it actually is, um, but it's here. And so we're continuing to keep a watchful eye on this, but luckily so far, the ARC has not had a case, although we have tested lots of times, but nothing so far here. Um, but we'll continue to work hard to um, protect everybody and all of our animals. So this year had some pretty cool animals walk through the door too, though. Um, this year we rescued and rehabbed a American alligator, uh, not for the faint of heart, um, but this, this guy needed our help. It was on the beach um, and it was pretty thin. It was super dehydrated, had an eye injury. So it got some long lasting antibiotics. So one poke and then wait two weeks. We have antibiotics you give every day. This is a long one. Um, or a week, it was five, seven days or something. So we could not have to handle this um, alligator every day um, for safety reasons. And um, and to make sure we were very careful about not humanizing this animal. We did not want it to become reliant on people. So um, that was pretty, um, we were very careful. 
but a really cool experience nonetheless. We also had a bald eagle come in this year in uh, November. We're not permitted to care for bald eagles. You have to have a special permit for them. And we just don't really get them that often here, but we got to help it for a day and then we transferred it to another facility in San Antonio, but still pretty cool. Um, there's our veterinarian, Dr. Uh, Shana Whitaker. She's in um, you know, the upper corner and then the lower corner um, helping to care for, for our critters. Okay, so um, like I said, we've had a lot of challenges this year, but this is what keeps us going. This is the fuel. When you're faced with a brick wall, um, why do you keep doing it? Well, um, this is what puts the gas in your tank. Um, so the best part of the job, we get to release some cool animals. Um, this year we released 217 sea turtles, about 82% survival rate. Um, and that's pretty special. And we like to do a lot of public releases. The public love it, and it's a great educational um, opportunity. So um, birds, we were able to release 234 birds, 71% survival rate. This is Christmas. She's a red-tailed hawk. She was with us for about a year. Um, and so um, she had a lot of challenges. Uh, our Volunteers grew to love her very much. And so when she finally soared away beautifully, might I add, um, it was a pretty special day. Um, that video is on our, our social media. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Um, she's a cool bird. Anyway, um, speaking of volunteers, so uh, if you're a volunteer for the ARC, if you help turtle patrol, if you help rescue animals, whatever, just stand up, stand up. I mean, give these people a big, big round of applause. Um, big round of applause. So um, 800 of all of the animals that we, we took in, volunteers had a part to play in, um, bringing them to us. That's huge. That's a big weight off of our shoulders. And um, I'll forever be grateful for all of the help. Um, that we've received this year. Amazing. Nesting turtles. We um, also work with nesting turtles. I think I'm well over my time. So, oh, no, no, sorry. We're still in. Okay, we're good. Uh, nesting turtles. Um, we had a really good nesting year. We had 14 turtles on Mustang Island and eight on San Jose. That's what, 1,400 eggs that we help protect on Mustang Island and about 700 on San Jose. But the really cool thing that happened this year was we had a green sea turtle nest. Um, we, I was in my bed. I'd already taken my shower. My baby was asleep. Um, and I get this call at 11, 1130 at night about this green sea turtle nesting. We never see this. And this is only the second time that anyone's, that we've ever had a green turtle nest. Um, but we never see them nest because they're night nesters. And so we had someone on the beach that happened to be there and they gave us a call. So I get this call at 1130 and I'm like, I'm going to this turtle. There is no way I'm missing this. I don't care about the sand. I'll reshower. Um, and so we go and it was hours out there, but one of the coolest experiences of my life, um, 134 eggs. That's a lot of um, boxes to prepare. Thank you guys, that helped. Um, and <laughs> all in one nest, yes. Um, and she weighed probably what, 100, I mean, 350 pounds, 400 pounds. These turtles are the second largest of all the sea turtles. So um, pretty remarkable experience. And one I will never forget. I hope to have another one next year and the year after and every year from here into eternity. Um, okay. So moving on to kind of a sadder um, topic, we also lost a couple of our um, residents, um, uh, ambassadors at the ARC. And, um, you know, some of you might have met these guys. And so um, I just wanted to mention um, uh, Millie, our, our Peregrine Falcon, Nosy, our Kim Sridley, and uh, Sparky, our black Billy Whistling Duck. Um, Sparky, you know, everyone's got their favorites, but Sparky was a big favorite of many people's and uh, and all of them were really, really special. So um, yeah, if they touched your hearts, um, they're gone, but not forgotten. Um, 
All right. Good news. Yes. Some of them have been here for a while. Um, Millie was 2018. She was the newest of the bunch. Um, Nosy since 2011. Um, and uh, Sparky, I want to say maybe 2013, 2015, something like that. So yes, a long time. Yeah. Um, all right, good news now. Go back to happy. Um, we're celebrating this year. Well, in 2022 was our 40th year of um, the ARC, 40 years of conservation. Yes. There are lovely t-shirts in the back to celebrate that if you want one. They are limited edition only this time. Can you get it? Okay. Um, so 40 years of conservation. And I cannot talk about... Um, that 40 years and the arc without also mentioning a little bit about Tony. So um, Tony was, um, he was a research fellow at the University of Texas Marine Science Institute. He was hired in 1976 um, and um, he didn't know much about his home, but he was very passionate about um, the environment and about birds. So he started counting um, birds and going to the same stretch of beach every single day to count them. Um, but in that process, he discovered um, that there were a lot of animals in distress. And so he established the ark. Um, and, um, and so um, he conducted in his life, nearly 6,000 beach surveys. It's crazy to think about, 6,000 times he drove up and down those beaches um, looking at all those amazing animals. Um, he used that data to educate um, thousands of people and he wrote over 1,500 articles about protecting the beaches and the animals. Um, I had the immense, immense pleasure of uh, working with Tony for about a year and um, it was, incredibly short too short um but there are those people that you meet in your life that um they they can change you as a person and uh, he had that effect on me and i'm sure he had that effect on many of you too so um he was a special special person um so the arc um over the course of those 40 years we we help to protect, document, um, you know, rehab, rescue over 52,000 animals. That's a rough estimate, but I think it's pretty close actually. Probably a lower estimate than actuality. Um, 52,000 animals. It's, it's, I don't know, I'm speechless on that number. So looking towards the future, um, 2023 and beyond. Um, 2023 has already started with its own new set of challenges, um, but we we know the best way to honor Tony um, and to honor his legacy is to continue his life's work at the ARC and continue working hard here. So what we are very, very excited about um, is the possibility, um, well, not a possibility, it's gonna happen, of a new rehab hospital. Um, yeah, so um, it's really exciting. Um, and so we we got this grant after Hurricane Harvey, it's been a long time coming, um, but it, something is happening, which is great. And so, um, so this is sort of a rendering of what it might look like. It's gonna have um, kind of all the cool things. It'll have a commissary, a place for our volunteers to cut up fish and rats for our raptors. There'll be a fridge and laundry and all that cool necessary stuff. And then there's gonna be a surgery suite that is state of the art. It'll have, um, it'll have x-ray, ultrasound, endoscope, um, cold stun, I mean, cold laser, therapy laser, um, and uh, surgical laser storage, just really everything you could possibly want and need. Um, I've found grants for those things, which is pretty cool. And then, <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, and then um, we'll also have a, an amazing rehab room too for our animals um, with stainless steel caging and um, uh, swim tanks for our pellies. And um, hopefully everything will be way more organized and wonderful. 
we'll have some some office space as well. So um, good things coming. Um, 2022 also brought some good changes to our facilities. We, I was able to get a grant to um, replace all of the siding and the roof on our oil wildlife facility. That's that metal building up there. Um, and so it was resting and uh, it would really needed some TLC. And so we were able to get some money together and uh, get that redone. Now it is very close to being complete, but I can't chalk it off to 2022. It'll be a 2023 thing, but um, new lights, all the good stuff. Um, huh? Um, sorry, let's see if I can figure out how this thing works. It is, is that is this thing. Right there. Yeah. Oh, it's not working. Um, it's this long one over there. Oh wait, something is happening. Oh, there we go. There, this this got new roof, new siding, um, new lights. So we got some money for that. That holds six turtle tanks. So it's really important for the work that we do. And then at the very tail end is a room that allows us to do oiled wildlife, uh, cleaning and care. So also really imperative, especially right now. Um, and so another thing that we got completed this year was we got a grant, uh, no, uh, well, a grant for the Earl C. Sands Foundation and a generous donation from the Corpus Christi Hooks, our local baseball team. Um, and that money we put towards uh, replacing the netting on our big pelican aviary. So we finally got that finished this year and that was huge. So happy to have those guys back home in their beautiful um, aviary. So um, lots of good things coming um, and things that we got done too. Okay, let's see, gotta get back on track. Dolphins? Yeah. Um, so we don't treat dolphins anymore. The ARC used to treat dolphins many years ago, um, but and we used to do it in our big barnacle bill tank, which is that kind of green cover on top. Um, so we used to, treat dolphins right there and that meant uh, volunteers watching these dolphins 24 hours a day um, and monitoring what they do how much food they're eating and everything um, constantly it was a lot of work huh um so the marine mammal stranding network will um they decide where the, the the dolphin will go but they work with the texas state aquarium with sea world in san antonio will take turtles i mean take uh dolphins as well as there's a facility in in galveston that also rehabs them um so um so every year since i began working with the arc um we have um we have been faced with Challenge after challenge. Um, 2017 brought the loss of Tony and uh, Hurricane Harvey, which decimated the arc. Um, uh, January of 2018 was um, the largest cold stunning that we had ever seen. Um, and uh, that summer brought our largest brown pelican admissions. Um, 2019 brought constant green sea turtle strandings due to high tides. Um, onshore winds and a high recruitment of juvenile green turtles. We were getting like 20 turtles a day um, throughout the whole summer. So it was pretty grueling. Um, in 2020, the, the world changed um, thanks to the global pandemic. Um, and we that year we lost all of our volunteer help and that was awful, <laughs> so awful and so difficult. Um, and we didn't get our volunteers back until July of 20, um, 2021. So it was quite a long time. Um, and then in 2021, winter storm Yuri hit, which affected 13,000 turtles. Um, and many of those perished in that event. Um, that lasted for two weeks of grueling work. And, um, you know, it left a lot of scars on a lot of those volunteers that helped in that event and our staff. It was very difficult. Um, and then, um, so every year we we weather the storm, we do. And we find a way through it all um, because we we owe that to the animals. We, we owe that to Tony and his memory. We, um, 
and we owe it to all of these amazing people, amazing, hardworking people up here that give so much to the ARC. And so um, I just like to end saying thank you to all of them and also thank you to all of you for coming today. So, yeah.